at Telethon Kids. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Facebook Live. My name is Renza Shabilia from Diabetes Australia. And today I am joined by Craig Kaplan, who is over in Perth. But before we begin, I would like to recognise the traditional owners on the lands where we're all viewing from. I am on Wurundjeri land as ever. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Craig, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Could you tell everybody who you are and, and where you are and all of those sorts of things? Yes. Sure thing. Yeah, thanks, Renza. Um, it's a, a pleasure to join you. My name is Craig Taplin. Um, I am a paediatric endocrinologist in Perth, at, at, based at Perth Children's Hospital, and I'm the clinical lead for our diabetes services within the endocrinology department um, at the Children's Diabetes Centre, and I'm also a research associate at Telethon Kids as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, one of the, well, the main reason that we're having today's Facebook Live with this topic is because there has been some research that has recently come out about um, the link between type 1 diabetes in kids and COVID. Um, so that sort of was the impetus for bringing us together to have this talk. But we're really going to talk more broadly about COVID and children. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them. You can pop them in the comment section of Facebook. If you would like a question um, to, and want to ask it anonymously, just send us a message on Facebook and we won't read out your name and no one else will see it, but we will certainly get to it if we can. Of course, we can't give individualised, personalised care or anything like that, but we can talk generally. So if you've got any questions about your children with diabetes, even if adults with diabetes, look, we can throw everything in the mix and if we can't answer them, we'll say we can't answer it, but uh, let, let's have a go. So, Craig, let's talk about this research. That's what we're going to start with, and that is that there seems to be or perhaps we're seeing maybe a link between children who have developed um, COVID or who have had COVID and then developing um, type 1 diabetes. We've seen increased numbers. What's the link? How, how robust is this research and what are we learning? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so there was a, a publication released by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in the US uh, recently, and, uh, and that has gotten some attention. Um, and I, th I think before we go into that study, I, I certainly would say that this is quite preliminary and caution applies. I think we should be very careful not to over interpret the results. Um, so, so with that said, the, the, the investigators looked at two large uh, healthcare databases in the US and they tried to, to, to see whether the rate of COVID, sorry, whether the rate of diabetes in youth was different after a COVID infection compared to a, a control group. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the key things I think for that we would want people to understand is, is that study design is, is potentially problematic. Okay. Um, the, they did find a higher risk for a diagnosis of, of diabetes in the period after a, after a COVID infection. But the first thing to say is um, they were not able to comment or differentiate types of diabetes within that. And so we don't know whether that was driven by type 1 or type 2 or both. Um, the, 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 the research line doesn't allow for, for that fine detail. So that's the first thing to say. Um, and so we don't know whether, whether that study actually reported a higher rate of type 1 diabetes at all. We, right. It was an undifferentiated diagnosis. The, the other thing is that study designs like that are potentially um, over representing the, the rate of, of diabetes in the COVID cases and under-reporting potentially the rate of diabetes in those children who didn't have a diagnosis of diabetes. So we don't actually know that they captured all the patients with COVID. We only know that they captured patients who presented with symptoms. Right. And I think this comes to the more broad question, Renza, or the more broad um, uh, topic, and that is that for many children or perhaps um, a large proportion of children, COVID is a very mild disease. And in fact, it may well be asymptomatic in a large proportion. And so we're not sure um, in that study whether those youth were captured at all. Okay. And so that would potentially um, change the, 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 um, the results. And so 
And we also don't know anything about the background of, of the two groups in terms of other risk factors that might also predict a higher prevalence of diabetes, such as uh, BMI or ethnicity or some of these other things, particularly if we're thinking that some of those patients actually had, had type 2 diabetes. So there's, there's lots of reasons, I think, just for us to, to be cautious um, before we, we, um, we, we draw any strong conclusions. I think it's fair to say that, that um, it's an interesting finding, but it's, um, the jury is still very much out and I wouldn't be overly concerned um, okay. at this stage. Yeah. Now, somebody has asked a question, and again, whilst this is a specific question and a real-life example, let's perhaps talk about this as a hypothetical, if we can. So somebody has said that their 12-year-old granddaughter was in New York in January 2020. I was there too at that time, actually. <laughs> COVID was just being spoken about, and that's true. It, I, I remember hardly anybody was speaking about COVID. It was like murmurings about something that was happening elsewhere, but it wasn't something that people were generally really concerned about. Mm -hmm. It says that her granddaughter arrived back in Australia with a dreadful cough and she had that for a few weeks and then in October 2020 she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is there a possible link could it have been that she had COVID nobody would have been checking back there I don't think as routinely certainly when um when they, when her um her granddaughter came home with a cough but could that possibly have been an issue what do you think yeah I mean I think it's a very understandable question and and it, it, it's, a sim, it's a similar question that I think a lot of parents and families wonder about when a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes is made in, in their child or their adolescent. It's, it's, I think, absolutely understandable to then go back in time and see if there's anything that well, we can point to that might have, have been implicated. So the first thing to say, I suppose, is quite possible that that was COVID. We, we, were, we won't really ever know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah but almost certainly the virus was circulating at that time. And so it's, it's possible. Um, similarly, however, viral infections at that time of the year, of course, January, the Northern Hemisphere is the middle of the viral season anyway. And so that would be an enormously common scenario, you know, no matter, no matter what. It's also, I think, important for families to, to understand, and this is on us to explain and just work through what what we know about why type one diabetes develops? Yes. Um, and and the the what we know is that for the vast majority of children who go on to have a diagnosis of type one, say at age twelve, the those those children have had evidence of the underlying autoimmunity for much longer than eight months. Right. Uh, okay. Before they become diagnosed, many have had evidence of of positive autoantibodies, that is that the markers of the underlying autoimmune process that leads eventually to a diagnosis of type one, that, that's been present for usually several years before someone actually becomes symptomatic. And so in this particular situation, it's worth thinking that it's quite likely that, that it wasn't that infection, whatever it was, that, that triggered the underlying process that led to, to type one. We don't really know with any definitive proof whether an acute illness then accelerates that process. There's been some research over the last 20 years or so that suggests that in some situations that might be true. Um, I think the bottom line is um, this, for, the, for this family and in general, there wasn't anything differently that I would have done or that you could have done yes. to, change, to change that outcome. Yeah. And almost certainly the, the markers of type 1 were in, in situations like this are almost certainly present well before that, that, um, that viral illness less than a year beforehand. Yeah, we had a really great one of these Q&As last year, I think it was, with John Wentworth talking about yeah. type 1 screen and talking yep. about um, how, how we're learning more and more about um, the onset of type 1 diabetes. But what we do certainly know is that it's not a, this happens overnight or, um, you know, it's a very complex, I guess, um, yes. process. But um, we might actually see if we can just share the link um, to that Q&A too so people can go back and have a look. I... As somebody living with type 1, I completely understand wanting to be able to pinpoint a reason. And there are lots of reasons why that's important to people. For me, it's because, well, one of the reasons is I want to know what happened so I can do everything I possibly can to prevent that happening yeah. to my daughter. So, yeah, you know, I, I, that, that's, you know, so I understand we're always 
trying to find a reason. And unfortunately, we don't have those answers yet. But every bit of research I sort of feel is helping us at least if, even if we're not solving the puzzle, we're at least moving the, the pieces around to get a clearer picture. And hopefully one day it will mean that we do have a clear picture and an understanding of what it is. Yeah, and I think that's a really, really good point, Renza. I think we're always, um, we're looking for meaning in, in what happens. And I think it's totally understandable to try and find um, and to look back in time and see if there was something that might have triggered it. One of the things that I always say when I meet a new family in those first few days is to make sure that they know that there isn't anything that they did wrong yes. or that they could have done differently um, based on the understanding of the science we have now. And you're right, we actually don't know what the trigger is to cause type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, we're not even sure if it's just one trigger or exposure it may be different things for different people as well we do know some things that it probably isn't um, and there's been work looking at for example vitamin d deficiency was one of the early hypotheses and yes. um, and gluten exposure is another one um, and we know that there are certain things that might slightly raise or lower the risk of type 1 diabetes things around when solids and, and, and other things are introduced. Um, but the sum total of all of that evidence is we understand how type 1 diabetes happens to some degree, but we still don't know why. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, and viruses have come under that umbrella as well, mm -hmm. you know, enteroviruses particularly rather than coronaviruses. But yeah. um, the bottom line is we just don't know. And we would, I would totally agree with you. It's absolutely understandable to, to try and find something and to, mm -hmm. to avoid exposures. Um, but it's really hard to give any any specific advice. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. And I think you know COVID fits into that into that as well. I, I wouldn't do anything differently to what I the way I would approach um, the 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 COVID pandemic in in any other healthy child. Yeah, absolutely. I, I as I said, it, it's it is really interesting what we take from research. And and I remember, so my daughter's now seventeen, but I remember when she was new, and um, you know, I'd read so much about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, and which is already contentious. But then throw giant one in there, and there's guilt everywhere. Yeah, breastfed her for as long as I could, delayed this, delayed that, avoided this, avoided that, and. At the end of the day, I just felt that I was trying to do what I could. And I think that that's, you know, that's often all we can do when we don't know the answers. You just do, you pick the bits that you feel you can control, control those, and, and hopefully that'll make you feel a bit better. But it is yeah. so tough. It's really tough. So couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't agree more. find answers. But you did say that there are things um, that, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily do anything different to a child without diabetes. Like, can we just talk a little bit? Because I know that, as I said, sometimes it does feel like you can't do anything, but we can do some things, right? And one of those things is we can do everything we possibly can to try to prevent getting COVID, knowing that it's out there and you may get it. We've spoken about this, but let's just touch on these things again. What are the sorts of things that we need to remember and be doing? And I know we're, I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of thinking about washing my hands, all of that sort of stuff. Sure. But let's, just do, let's just mention them so that we, we do that and talk about that messaging. So what's the important stuff? I think the important thing is that the health advice for children is no different for kids with diabetes to, to any other healthy kids. And that's the bottom line. So um, vaccination is the obvious one yep. to mention straight away. And... Yep. Vaccines are absolutely recommended by ATAGI and all the major diabetes centres around the country and the world for that matter. Yes. Um, so diabetes, uh, whatever form of diabetes, but specifically type 1, because that's what we're talking about today, um, are, we recommend that those kids be vaccinated on par with their peers. So for the 5 to 11-year-olds, absolutely. Um, and for the older adolescents and young adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, and to, to that point, um, we have good evidence to suggest that the vaccine is both just as safe and just as effective for children and adolescents. And so we know that the, their antibody responses to the vaccine in the trials, there are lots of, lots of people with type 1 diabetes in those trials. And the vaccine, um, the antibody responses were just as robust. And so that, that would be the first thing and probably the most important thing I would say. 
Uh, and of course, following all the normal guidelines around um, public health measures, mask wearing where appropriate, mm -hmm. et cetera, we would support those. I think the other thing is from a diabetes specific point of view, um, we don't have very good data on this in children, I would say. However, there is some potential evidence in adults that gl glucose control leading up to a diagnosis of COVID might be part of the risk for a more complicated infection. And so oh. I think it's important to, to, to just put, put it out there that I know all families are always working hard every day. It's such a challenging condition to, uh, to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, it, you know, it's, that being said, if, if, the, the, if we can achieve more target glucose levels, perhaps a you know, lower hemoglobin A1C or a higher time in range, those things may well help us in reducing the risks of a more severe infection. And in the adults with type 1 overseas, that, that may be associated with a more severe course. That said, in children, it's a mild illness anyway. And so we, we um, but we would, the, the other thing I would say that's really important is for, for families to have confidence in their sick day management plan. So making yes. sure that they've worked with their clinic team to know what to do around acute viral illnesses, how to, when to check for ketones, ketones um, those common sense things. Yep. And what I can say anecdotally is that um, from, and now I'm in Western Australia, we don't have a large disease burden, yes. um, but it's likely coming. But from, from centres on the East Coast who've had a lot more experience, um, anecdotally, it doesn't appear that the, the management of acute illness or acute viral illness with type 1 is, is dramatically different. It's covid or anything else. And so the message there would be sick day management, know your plan. If you're not sure, please talk to your team, but that plan should work well to prevent any uh, complications and particularly ketones. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's all, also probably a really good opportunity to remind anybody who uh, is taking, is using insulin and needs to think about people with type one diabetes to think about making sure that you have in date ketone strips because I checked mine not long ago and they were out of date. So I scrambled to the pharmacy to get some in date ones that your meter works. So my ketone meter needs charging. I did make sure that it would still charge if I needed it and it did. Um, and just having a look and, and popping together your, uh, your kit for these sorts of things so that if you do get that diagnosis, you don't need to scramble them because you might be isolating. That's the other thing to think about is exactly. that you, your whole yep. family might need to isolate. Uh, if you can pull that uh, kit together. I, I know I get really frustrated having to throw things out because they're out of date still often might use them and check with an in date one or something but um yeah. I, I know that but it, it, look if there's a time where you want to have everything so this is one less thing one fewer thing to have to stress about at the time of a COVID diagnosis uh get your uh your sick day management kit together 100 yeah. 100 yep, yep. All right, so we have a question here that, and Craig, look, this is about um, type one or LADA, which is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to answer this and we can, you know, we can absolutely always come back to and, and write a response to this later on. But um, according to the endocrinologist, um, I got mine at 53 because of the flu stressing my body. So given that, you know, this is also sometimes something that adults are told, there could have been a virus or a flu or whatever, um, uh, should we also be thinking about how COVID is impacting adults with diabetes? And I know that that is actually certainly something that's being done, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, hard for me to comment. I'm a paediatrician, so I would put yep. that out there straight away. Yes. Um, that said, uh, type 1 diabetes in adults is, is common. In fact, up to half of people with type 1 are actually diagnosed in adulthood. Um, and yep. we, 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 more broadly, we do see more and more patients with type 1 being diagnosed in, that, in, that mid, in middle age particularly. Um, and it's probably a, a disease, you know, a condition that's more similar to, to youth onset type one than, than it's different. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that suggests that in, in adults that the triggers are, are any different to those in youth. Yes. Um, so, 
I think it's hard to, to pick apart that exact comment, but it may be, again, a reflection of an acute illness that exacerbates an acute presentation, but that the underlying, you know, so when, we, when we're sick with influenza, for example, there's a very significant inflammatory response. We have a high fever, and that may unmask an emerging presentation with diabetes. That's plausible. Yep. Um, and, and, but it's, it's um, I'm not aware of any evidence in, in adults that it actually is the cause of the underlying autoimmune process. So again, coming to that point that people diagnosed with type one may well have had evidence of autoimmunity for years prior to the acute presentation. While we're talking about this, I, I've got some more questions, but I wanna jump back a step because we did talk about vaccinations and this has been something that we have spoken about before, but I really just wanna to touch on it again. Sure. Um, Diabetes Australia has throughout um, COVID since vaccinations have been available, we have been very clear about, about supporting all health measures, me measures and encouraging people to get vaccinated. I personally spent sort of hours on the phone the second I could get jabbed to find an appointment and rolled up my sleeve in front of anyone who would jab me basically. Um, and that is certainly, uh, you know, the message that we are saying, please do get vaccinated. Um, however, we do know mm -hmm. that there are concerns from some people who talk about their own experiences and their family's experiences. My child got vaccinated and then they got diabetes. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we know there's no evidence to support that. Um, can we just touch on that and just reassure anybody who, especially in that 5 to 11-year-old age group, I guess, who are just now um, eligible for the vaccine or the last month or so, and they're wondering about that, yeah. what would you say? Yeah, it's a great question. And again, very understandable question. We have no evidence that the vaccine is associated tr with, no strong evidence that the vaccine is associated with an, uh, uh, with causing or associated with a, with a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Um, now, it's also important to remember that type 1 diabetes is not an uncommon diagnosis in that age group. And so there's going to be a, a background appearance of type 1 diabetes, um, regardless of whether, whether there's a vaccination program in place for COVID or not. And so it's much, much more likely that that's a diagnosis of type 1 that's coincidental rather than truly associated with, with vaccination. Okay, yep. Um, now, side effects of the vaccine are, are reasonably common, but they're usually mild and, and fairly similar to an acute viral illness sometimes with maybe a low-grade fever or some aches and pains. And, and it's natural, I think, for families to wonder, you know, was that somehow then, did that somehow then lead to the appearance of high blood glucose levels? But mm -hmm. we just don't have any evidence to support that. And again, it's likely that the underlying process was, a, was, um, was um, smouldering away behind yes. the scenes well before, well before the vaccine. Yeah, and I think that that's something really important to remember is that, you know, the timing could just have been unfortunate because yep. we do frequently see people say, my kid got vaccinated the next week they were diagnosed. But diabetes yep. isn't a one-week process. It's not like Correct. your body decides in a week that it is now going to develop type 1 diabetes. That's absolutely right. All right, we've got a bit of a general type 1 question here and COVID question. Um, so somebody has said that there's type 1 diabetes uh, in the family with other autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to know how far to go regarding precautions to avoid COVID with other family members working and going to school. Everybody's vaxxed. Uh, so the question is, uh, should we isolate uh, the type 1 diabetes person in the family and how are type 1 diabetes people getting through COVID? So there's two questions there. Yeah. Um, Really, really important questions. Um, the first, the first one about should we isolate someone specifically just because they have type one? I would say no. I would say that there's no reason to do that. Um, the we know that youth with type one diabetes generally do extremely well. As I said before, um, they're no more at risk of catching COVID. Yes. Um, people with type one diabetes are not. One of the common things I think that's we probably don't do a very good job of explaining as, as healthcare providers is this concept of immunosuppression or yep. immunocompromised. Yep. And, and people with type 1 diabetes are not immunocompromised um, and so therefore not, no, no more likely um, 
to 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 catch a COVID or have a COVID infection than mm -hmm. than anyone else in the general healthy population. So in, so there's no in my view no no need to to take any extra precautions over and above standard common sense and health department. Um, and I think we always have to remember that we're trying to make sure the message is always to try and have youth with type 1 diabetes have a normal as normal a childhood as possible. And, yeah. and the message is, is the, quite the opposite of exclusionary messages. And I think that applies to a, a pandemic. Now, I, you know, it makes sense, of course, to, to work hard on, um, on glucose control. I mean, I think that's a common sense thing. And I'm sure this family's working extremely hard like all families do and doing the best they possibly can. But outside that and vaccination, I think standard common sense um, precautions a, a apply. In terms of how kids with COVID, uh, COVID infection are actually doing, we don't have a lot of actual data to report so far, but um, we know that the rate of admission on um, in our centres, our, our colleagues over east, it's extremely low. Um, for youth with diabetes who've had a, a COVID infection, there's, there's been, as I understand it, um, very low rate of admission. Um, and so it would appear that, and of course, these, this is a highly, these are all highly vaccinated populations essentially. And so it's likely that there's some protection there for sure. But, but doing extremely well is the, is the answer. Um, and, um, and I'm also hearing that the number of calls and to the emergency triage support lines where we can provide advice over the phone is quite similar. And so I think, I think the message is actually really quite reassuring, Renza, that with, um, with vaccination and with common sense precautions and some, um, as you said, preparation with extra supplies and knowing the sick day plan, we're hope, we hope that the vast majority of kids will, will recover very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. We had the COVID fairy visit our house. Uh -huh. Maybe a nice way to think about it. Uh, and um, my husband and daughter both had COVID. Everybody's vaccinated. And so they were, my, my husband reckons he had a bit of a sniffle. My daughter said she had a bit of a cough. Oh, sorry. My daughter had, she said it felt like a head cold. And I was determined that you know, I needed to be protected. So we all isolated within the house and we only have one bathroom. It's not like, you know, everybody could go to their own corner. And But what was really important was that we tried everything we could to, you know, protect me, I guess, you know, somebody yeah. who I know that I'm not more at risk of catching it, but I don't want to catch I don't want to deal with glucose levels while I've got any, any sort of infection. So, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. everything yeah. possible. And um, I was so pleased that there, like, I just felt, so in control of the measures that we could do. It, it just felt so reassuring. Unfortunately, yeah. got to the end of our isolation period and I remained COVID free. Um, but there is real a real sense of power in being able to manage a situation as you can for yourself um, in your own in your own home and in your own situation. So I think that that's something. I, I, you know, pandemic life feels so out of control and there's so much that we can't do anything about, but I just have really understood the power of being able to manage what you can do. And um, that is a message I think that we need to just keep sharing as well and get vaccinated. Please Absolutely. Uh, you, yeah, <laughs> you, you're quite right. Being prepared, making sure you've got extra supplies, yeah. knowing you're going to need to isolate for, for a period of time, yes. making sure you've got extra supplies, um, for kids, um, it, it might be worth mentioning a couple of things. There's a couple of common questions that we're already receiving from families, and maybe you've got some questions there already. One of them is about what medications can we use to treat, yes. to treat symptoms. And, and the short answer is anything you would normally use is fine, uh, paracetamol, ibuprofen. Um, and then, of course, in, in children, um, at least for us and, and for many centres around the country, the, the use of continuous glucose monitoring is very high because of it, because of the universal funding support in yeah. children. And it's just worth reminding um, some families, particularly those using the, the G, Dexcom G5, that, that paracetamol can impact the accuracy there. And so we should make sure to come back to your point that you've got a backup supply yeah. of blood glucose test strips and things that the, the uh, G6 system is not impacted by paracetamol. That's also worth knowing for families. Ibuprofen is fine um, and it 
can impact the, the Medtronic CDM. So it's worth remembering some of those pieces before they should touch base with their clinic team. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and just being prepared to, to hunker down, knowing, knowing what your, your clinic phone number is and you need to call. Just the, those basics, I think, are, yeah. are important. Families yeah. might also be wondering how common is it for kids to get really sick and need to go to hospital with COVID? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's probably somewhere around 1%. So about one, just under one in every 100 children, not, not with diabetes specifically, but more generally, it appears that, that the rate of hospitalization is less than 1%. Yep. Um, or thereabouts. So that's that's pretty reassuring. And the rate of a really severe illness is much lower than that. So Yes, absolutely. These are all facts that I think, I hope that they're helpful for people who are watching. And again, it is easy to become overwhelmed. And, if, and I just would like to add that if anybody is feeling really overwhelmed, which is completely understandable, can I encourage people to go and have a chat with their GP and talk about perhaps getting a referral to, to having a chat with the counsellor or a psychologist or a social worker? It is perfectly understandable. And look, we have been hearing for over two years that this is only going to affect people with, you know, an underlying health condition or who are older as if we're a little bit, um, you know, we're a bit dispensable. And so I understand why people might be feeling anxious perfectly understandable if you are feeling that way there is help though and I would really encourage people to have a chat with their GP about that because I think that for a lot of people it is feeling quite overwhelming we're, we're you know ticking over into year three of this and sometimes it feels like there's no end in sight there is pandemics don't last forever um, but if you need some help there it, there's nothing wrong with asking for that and I, I guess that was my question for you is that something that you're seeing are people feeling quite anxious I um, yes, definitely. And I think it's more a cumulative impact of the last two years, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think parents have been carrying a lot, um, both both cognitively and, you know, just that mental burden of, of, of wondering when this is going to end and is it is it going to, um, how is it going to impact youth with diabetes and all those questions. Are the vaccines going to be safe for children with diabetes? There's been a lot of mental load to carry for parents as well as kids of course and mm -hmm. then I think you throw in the 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 periods of lockdown and um, we've been relatively blessed here in Western Australia to have pretty minimal lockdowns but I know that other parts of the country that's been yeah. really hard um, and so that that I think that adds adds to the the mental burden that families with type 1 carry every day anyway and so we would 100% support what you just said, and that is that the mental, good mental health care and, and support in general is absolutely critical to, to chronic management. It's, it's hard enough at the best of times, yeah. and we need all the support that we can get, and that is totally okay. Um, I often think about kids who've, had, who've missed out on periods of schooling and, and all of the social benefits that that carries, which are not to be underestimated. And so whether it's parents who need some a mental health plan from their GP or an, an adolescent or a child, I think that we, we actually do a lot of that coordinating of care in our diabetes clinic. And sometimes it's, it's the sole focus of a visit because it's such an important part of the diabetes picture. Absolutely. Craig, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I know this is just, we, we've had, we've seen so much discussion online and in different groups about, um, about these sorts of issues. So thank you for joining us and for being so open and for answering questions. And hopefully people who are watching are feeling a bit reassured or a little bit more, um, I guess, armed with information of what they can do at home. Um, Please remember everybody, Diabetes Australia is here. You can ask us any questions and we'll get back to you or we'll be able to direct you in the right way. Uh, we, we, we know this is a really tricky time. You're not alone though. We are here to help you and to support you. Uh, we will be back with another Q&A in a couple of weeks, but in the meantime, this one will remain up on our Facebook um, page and through other social channels as well, including on YouTube. So if you've got a family member who you think would be, um, who would uh, benefit from this, but they're not on Facebook, we can share the link to make sure that you can um, view it there as well. So thank you very, very much. Thanks to everyone watching. Thank you again, Craig. Thanks, Renzo. Pleasure. Bye-bye.